going to get into Ephesus and the book of Acts, chapter 19. And just to do a quick recap here, we have been in this Unstoppable series over the whole summer. We started out in June in our Unstoppable expansion part of our series, where Paul, along with his traveling companions like Silas and Barnabas and Timothy and others, started to leave and travel from Antioch and begin their missionary journeys. Antioch became a big missionary sending hub, a place where people were going out from, and the church began to expand across the Roman Empire. In July, we talked about unstoppable unity. There was, as the church grew and changed, became more diverse, the Gentiles received the gospel. It had crossed racial and cultural boundaries. The church had to wrestle through some things. What is it, what does the gospel really mean? What does this look like? How, how does it look now that everyone uh, beyond just the realm of Judaism are receiving the good news of Jesus and coming to genuine faith in him. And they had to wrestle through some things and learn how to debate some of that stuff and, and solidify what it means to really move the gospel forward and what is the heart of that. And once they resolved some of those things, uh, we moved into August with Unstoppable Church. And we have watched how uh, Paul has visited ever-expanding areas of influence as he has traveled to these different cities and impacted greater and greater regions of the Roman Empire. And today, as we look at the city of Ephesus, it is perhaps the most influential place that he has been yet. Uh, eventually, he will go to Rome, the very capital and heart of the empire, but for now, Ephesus is the biggest, perhaps most important place he has visited yet. And as we get into Ephesus, I want us to remember that uh, the book of Acts is not primarily a church planting guidebook. We have talked a lot about church planting. That's what Paul did, and we've, we've dealt a lot with that over the summer. Uh, it is also not uh, just a how-to step-by-step guide for sharing our faith, although we have talked a lot about that and how we each need to be partners in moving the gospel forward and sharing our faith and reaching new people. But it's not just a manual for that. The book of Acts is also not a biography of Paul. We've talked a lot about him. He's one of the main figures, for sure, uh, as he leads the missionary effort as God's chosen person. But it wasn't written just to be a biography of Paul. When Luke writes the book of Acts, it's really about this one thing. And as we think about where we have been this summer, and as we wrap up this series today, I want us to come back to this very important thing. The book of Acts is primarily about how a group of 12 ordinary men actually began to live out Jesus' final words of instruction on the earth. How these men, out of obedience, actually began to do the mission that Jesus had given them, the Great Commission that he gives them in Matthew. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you to me, sorry. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I am with you to the very end of the age. It is a story of 12 simple men and how they spread the gospel and how they really begin to live out Jesus' mission in the world. So how did they do that? What was the secret sauce for these disciples really being able to make this kind of massive impact that at this point where we are in the book of Acts is really beginning to send ripples and shockwaves throughout the cities and the regions of the empire. Dozens of churches planted, thousands of new believers in the face of really incredibly hard, a life-threatening persecution, and these guys were fishermen. They were simple, simple men, uh, many of them. They hadn't been to seminary. They had not, to my knowledge, attended a church planting seminar. These were simple guys who had been with Jesus. So how did they actually begin to live out the Great Commission? Paul says it so great in his letter, the first letter to the Corinthian church, that he writes while he's in Ephesus. I want to read this to you, chapter 2, the first few verses of 1 Corinthians. He says, to them, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive 
words, hear that, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Not with persuasive words, but with the Spirit's power. I want to talk to you about this idea today, because I think what the world needs today is not more persuasive Christians. As we think about what it is for us to really engage in the Great Commission, to really reach our neighbors and our co-workers, and share our faith, and build relationships, and be redemptive people in the places where God has placed us, it is not about being really convincing, and slick, and persuasive. That is not what the world needs most. What the world needs most is Holy Spirit-filled Christians. That is what makes the difference. That is how 12 really simple men lead us to where we are in the book of Acts. Now, again, dozens of churches, thousands of new believers. It's about the Holy Spirit. It's not about how awesome they were. It's about the Holy Spirit. Sometimes our uh, small human minds, uh, we begin to think that it's how hard we try. If we just work really hard at this, we have some big part to play, and God does want to use us, and we do have a part to play. But man, it is the Holy Spirit's power that makes the difference. He is the one that does the work. This comic strip, uh, I love Radio Free Babylon, some of you are probably familiar with it, uh, paints a great picture. The guy says, I'm ready, rested and ready to get back to work, Jesus. Jesus says, you sure, Joe? Positive, Jesus, 100%. Let's go minister, tag team, you and me. And Jesus says, you keep thinking of us as equal partners in this thing, Joe, you're going to burn out again in a week. The Holy Spirit is the one that empowers us and enables us to do the work, and we see this so clearly in Ephesus when Paul arrives there. It's interesting, uh, Paul is in Ephesus for three years, the longest he has stayed in any other place, and uh, a lot must have happened in those three years, but Luke decides to give us a snapshot of a few events that happened during this time in chapter 19. Before we get into those, let me bring you up to speed with where uh, we have been. Last week we were in Corinth. Paul leaves Corinth and he goes to Ephesus taking Priscilla and Aquila with him. You remember them from last week, hopefully. The ones that he mentored and invested in. And now they too are joining this work. So they go with him. He leaves them there in Ephesus. Uh, and really doesn't spend much time there. He goes into the synagogue, visits them. The people ask him to stay, but he says, no, uh, I'm not going to stay right now. I I'd love to come back and visit you. If God wills it, I will do that. And Paul leaves Priscilla and Aquila. Not really sure why he doesn't stay longer there in Ephesus. Uh, perhaps it's because a, back in chapter 16, you might remember, he wanted to go there, but the Holy Spirit had told him not to go to the province of Asia. So maybe he still feels like this isn't his time. In any case, he leaves Priscilla and Aquila there, and he returns to Antioch and reports to the people, once again, all that God has done to take the gospel to the Gentiles over the course of his second journey. And it's not really until his third journey, when he leaves Antioch, that he returns to Ephesus, and we really see uh, what happens in this city through the ministry of Paul. Again, he's there for three years, and Luke gives us a chapter for three years, so he is highlighting some of the key things that are happening here in the book, uh, or in the, in the city of Ephesus. There are two things that you need to know about the city of Ephesus to give us a picture of this place and what it was like. The first is, we know it is a very influential city. We've said that about a lot of the cities that Paul visited. It was his practice to find a, some major hub of life, whether it was uh, political power in Philippi, or it was knowledge and education in uh, Athens, or whether it was wealth and trade and commerce in Corinth, that was part of his strategy. Go to these key cities, and from there, the gospel will spread. But it seems, as we read Acts, that for some reason, Ephesus was particularly influential. It seems like for this area, and you see there on the map, the region of Asia, with Ephesus uh, noted there, for some reason, Ephesus was a especially influential across this region. Whatever was hip and popular in Ephesus would very soon be hip and popular everywhere else in Asia. And so when Paul goes there, it's very significant that he chooses to spend so much time in the city of Ephesus. 
A modern-day equivalent perhaps could be the city of Los Angeles. Being the capital of the entertainment and media uh, world, the things that happen in L.A. very quickly ripple across our country and really around the world, for better uh, or for worse. But no city quite has the impact uh, on our daily life like the city of Los Angeles does. This might be what Ephesus was like. Extremely influential. The hub of life in Asia. The second thing you need to know about the city of Ephesus is that there was a particular, among the people there, a particular fascination with magic and witchcraft. Uh, this seemed to be a collecting point for people who were heavily involved in this kind of activity. One person describes Ephesus as territory that Satan had firmly and manifestly in his grasp. Someone even says that people were addicted to magic. So uh, these are people heavily involved in the occult. Even today, I discovered uh, people who were involved in witchcraft activity today. There, there is a, 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 an incantation, if you will, that's called the Ephesian Gramata, or the Ephesian words, that people involved in this kind of activity today still use uh, as, as a, a, a words of power or protection. So there has been a long history of this city being uh, uh, captured by this kind of activity. And it's against that backdrop that Luke records these events, and we're going to look at a couple of them today. It gives us perspective, each of these, on the power of the Holy Spirit and what it really, in, what God intended it to do for us and with us. Let's look at the first event in uh, the first 10 verses of chapter 19 of Acts. They'll be on uh, the screen as well. It says, While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized. In the name of the Lord Jesus, when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about twelve men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God, but some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples, probably included those twelve and others, and uh, with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Listen to verse 10 again. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. This is not just a result of Ephesus being a very influential city. This is a result of what the Holy Spirit does. Luke doesn't tell us a whole lot about these, this group of 12, except that he does call them believers, which means they had faith in Jesus. Uh, it's unlikely he would have used that word if they were not genuine believers, but it's also clear that something is missing here. Something is lacking in their life, uh, whether it's uh, an incomplete understanding of who Jesus is and what he can do, what he did do with his life, or uh, whether it's just that Paul sees that they're not living the way that they ought to live. They don't have the empowerment from the Spirit to live as they should. In either case, he asks them the question, and it's a fascinating question, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? I don't know of any other place where Paul asks someone, did you receive the Holy Spirit? He can tell something is missing. Something is not right here. I may be putting too much spin on this, I don't know, but when I read it, I hear Paul sounding a little bit incredulous as he says, you say you believe, but did you actually receive the Holy Spirit? Because I'm not picking that up in your lives. I'm not seeing that. I don't know if they lacked the fruit of the Spirit. Maybe that was it. 
but he, he can tell something is missing. And then when they say they haven't even heard of the Spirit, he's even more surprised. And what in the world happened when you believed and when you came to faith? If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're missing out on all the fun, all the good things about life with Jesus. As well-intentioned as these, this group may have been, they were missing the power, the power in their life to actually live the way that Jesus has called them and has called us to live. And what happens when they receive the Holy Spirit? Boom. They begin to speak in other languages, and they begin to declare God's truth boldly. The Holy Spirit comes into their life, and that makes all of the difference for them. And as a result, we get verse 10. All the Jews and Greeks in the province of Asia hear as a result of that. Paul didn't do that all by himself. He didn't travel all over the province of Asia. It was these that received the Holy Spirit and others who came to believe in Ephesus that went out from that place and spread the gospel to other cities across the region. We know that multiple other churches were planted as a result of people who came to faith because of Paul's ministry in Ephesus. The church of Laodicea that's referenced in Revelation, that church was likely planted because of what Paul did in Ephesus and others. The church, uh, the Colossian church, that Paul writes a letter to, even though he never visited there himself, a church is planted because of people who came to faith through Paul's ministry. The power is the Holy Spirit. Not persuasive words, not being really impressive, not having an awesome, cool church, the power of the Holy Spirit. What the world needs is not for us to be more persuasive and convincing What the world needs is for us to live in and operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. The last time that I saw my friend Vincent was May of 94. He and I were 8th graders at Jackson Middle School in South Bend, Indiana. Go Tigers! And uh, Vincent was kind of an awkward guy, not a lot of friends and uh, a little bit on the geeky side. So I don't know if Vincent remembers me from Jackson Middle School, but if he does, it's probably for all the same reasons that I remember him. <laughs> and because I was a little bit of a geeky guy too at the time. Uh, still am a little bit. But I remember the day that I was sitting in homeroom with Vincent, and he was in the seat next to me, and God said to me, the Holy Spirit says to me, Matthew, Vincent needs to know about Jesus, and you're going to tell him. Okay. Um, So I started praying about that, and I started preparing how I was going to tell Vincent about Jesus. And I started thinking through uh, all of the questions that he might ask so that I could be prepared for those and practice my answers, wrote them out. These are the things that he might ask me. What if he asked about evolution? Because we've been talking about that in science class. And so I was preparing all these things. Any arguments or counter-arguments that he could come up with, I wanted to be ready to to respond to those. Uh, And and so I practiced that, and I laid it out for myself, and I prayed about it, and gearing myself up to be ready to make a really solid gospel presentation when the day came that I was supposed to tell Vincent about Jesus. And I remember... uh, the day at the end of gym class we were sitting on the bleachers and uh, a few minutes extra time in class so we're sitting on the bleachers Vincent is talking he'd had a rough week and the Holy Spirit says to me now Um, I had like at least 14 more things that I had not prepared and thought through I was like no I am not ready because if he says these things to me then I'm going to do a poor job, and if I do a poor job, then Jesus is going to be misrepresented, and I might only get one shot at this, so I had better do it right. It's funny how we think, we say things like that, like God can only give us one shot at these things, but I was convinced I, that this was not the time that the Holy Spirit says, no, now, now, you've got to do it now. This is the moment. And he said to me, just tell him what Jesus has done for you, and let me handle the rest. Don't worry about arguments that he's going to make. Don't worry about questions he's going to ask. Just tell him what Jesus has done for you and let me worry about the rest. 
few months before this moment, uh, I had surrendered my life fully to Christ at Fairmount Wesleyan Campground. We were a very cool evening that night when God really spoke to my heart. And so I thought, okay, well, I'll tell him about that for sure. And I did, sitting right there on the bleachers at the end of gym class. Everyone's around us, and I'm telling Vincent about what Jesus uh, has done for me. And I just, I asked him, Vincent, do you want to believe in Jesus? Do you want to follow him? And he said, yes. And we prayed right there on those bleachers with everyone around us. Uh, and he prayed, and he gave his life to Christ. It was an awesome moment. It was the first time that I, on my own, had led someone else to Christ. Bell rings just seconds after we're done praying. We go each go to our next class, and it hits me. My persuasive words, all the things that I had prepared in that moment, did not matter. Two things mattered. What has Jesus done for me? and following and being obedient to the Holy Spirit and doing what he told me to do. Persuasion and a slick presentation and being well rehearsed and feeling like you have all the answers is not ultimately what's going to save the people of East Fishers. It's going to be Jesus and us living obediently through the power of the Holy Spirit. That is what the world really needs for us to be doing. Let's look at the second event that happens in Ephesus. This is even uh, more interesting than the first one. We're going to look at verses 11 through 17 here to see what happens next. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, In the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priests, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them. I love this. Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Yikes. Now this is really strange. We've got magic, uh, handkerchiefs and aprons, and uh, demon-possessed people attacking other people. What in the world is this about? I think God knew exactly what the Ephesian people needed to see and hear. A people that were obsessed with magic and witchcraft and sorcery, God is elevating the power of the Holy Spirit in that kind of environment and saying this is where the power really is. These kind of miracles were extraordinary. Verse 11 tells us that they were not typical. This was not usually how God operated, but he knew in a place like Ephesus that that was needed. And of course, imitators soon start to appear. Man, if that's the name of Jesus and the name of Paul can do that, then I'm going to try it too, right? Maybe this will give me a leg up over the other magicians in the area, help my magic business. I don't know what their thinking was, but obviously they were lacking actual power because they did not have a relationship with Christ. You'll notice that they say, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, it's not personal, not in the name of my Jesus. They have no relationship with Jesus Christ, and therefore they do not have the power of the Holy Spirit. And of course, they cannot accomplish what they're trying to accomplish. Not only that, but they're overpowered. Just to be sure that it's clear that the Holy Spirit's power is greater, he overpowers them, takes all seven of the sons on at once, and wins handily. It's like Mayweather versus seven Conor McGregor's. Too soon? No. It's a demonstration of the Spirit's power. And God is saying, this is where it's at. Elevating the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. These men had no power without that. Because that is what convinces people. Not persuasive words, not smooth talk, the power of the Holy Spirit. 
I want you to watch a video here in just a second. We shared it a couple of weeks ago at our encounter baptism service. Some of you were there, and so you've seen this, but it's a great uh, thing to remember. Some of you haven't seen it. This is the testimony of one of our teens, Braden Batman, who was baptized that night at encounter baptism. I want you to listen to his story and his life-changing encounter with the power of the Holy Spirit. Take a look. Church, it was not persuasive words that convinced him. It was the power of the Holy Spirit in his life that made him come alive inside. As we seek to go out into the world and be a part of God's great commission, it's not about being slick. It's not about being convincing and persuasive. It's about following and being obedient to the Holy Spirit and sharing what it is that Jesus has done for us. And that should be a great encouragement to us because we do not do this alone and we certainly do not do it in our own strength. Last week I shared a prayer with you that I have been praying for our church and I want to read it again to you. I want to see one person, that's just a start by the way, one person come to Christ and be baptized because someone in this room, one of you sitting right here, one of us, shared our faith, built a relationship, and shared our faith. That is what I am dreaming of and I am praying for, and that that would be the first of hundreds, thousands of people in East Fishers that come to Christ, not because we are so convincing, not because we have the coolest church, but because we are obedient and we work within the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe this is going to happen. And I want to encourage you today about the Holy Spirit and what it is that he does for us. I want to read four statements for you as we wrap up uh, today. And I want you to think about these in your life. Maybe you take your next steps card and you'll note one of these down that you particularly need to remember and hold on to as you seek to reach the people around you. Go ahead and take out your next steps card. Take a pen. Maybe one of these, the Lord will speak to you and say, this is for you. I want you to remember this as you seek to share your faith. This is the first one. The Holy Spirit really does help you speak. These are Jesus' words to his disciples. He says, whenever you are arrested, to my knowledge, none of us are facing that, but the disciples were, whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking but the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit really does help you to speak. The second thing I want you to remember and be encouraged by is that the Holy Spirit is the one that does the convincing. The Holy Spirit convinces people. Again, Jesus speaking to his disciples, very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Think about that. He's getting ready to leave and he's telling the disciples, it's good for me to leave. Unless I go away, the advocate, that's the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit is the one that convinces people. The people that come to your mind that you are trying to reach, the Holy Spirit is already at work in their life, already calling to them, already doing it. Here's the third statement. The Holy Spirit enables you to be a witness. The Holy Spirit gives you that power. Again, Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. This is where we started in Acts, right? And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will receive the power of the Holy Spirit. You are not alone in this. And the last thought, the Holy Spirit intercedes for you. Think about that. The Holy Spirit is interceding for you. Paul writes to the Romans, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. I don't know what thoughts come to your mind when you think about being a part of the Great Commission, if that feels overwhelming, if that feels energizing, if that feels exciting, if that feels completely foreign. But if you have given your life to Jesus, you can be assured of these four statements. They are true for you. And just to make sure it sinks in, I want us to read them together. These four statements. Let's read them. The Holy Spirit helps me speak the Holy Spirit convinces people. The Holy Spirit
Spirit enables me to be a witness. The Holy Spirit intercedes for me. It is not about being persuasive and convincing. It is about following the Holy Spirit. That is what will change this world and this community and the people that you are reaching out to in your area of influence. We just want to thank you for watching the sermon online. If God is working in your heart, we would love to hear about it. You can go online, www.encountertrinity.com slash next steps card. You can fill out information there. Let us know what God is doing in your heart. If you need help with anything, we would love to.